This is the just announced Fujifilm X100V. Uh, no, it's not. Actually, this is the X100V. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And today I want to talk to you about Fujifilm's just announced X100V, latest in a line of legendary cameras that a number of you have insisted for years I ought to try. So yeah, that's how slow I am. Just as I get an X100F in-house to test, the new one comes along. But before we get into it, a quick update on our Streets of New York Street Photography workshops. October is sold out and now has a waiting list March and June are filling quickly. So on the one hand, yay. But if you'd like to join us in the greatest city on earth for the genre, walk legendary locations and visit iconic venues, learn technique and history, explore ethics, go through multiple edit and review cycles in a very supportive environment at the lovely Hasselblad New York Experience Studio, maybe even hone your unique artistic voice. And in any event, spend time with a lovely accomplished group of like-minded people please hop over to www.3bmep.com slash streets2, that's the number two, to learn more or register. We hope to see you there. Now, Claudia and I were in New York last week to spend a few hours with the X100V. The very first question some of you may have is, what is it? Well, for those of you who are already X100 fans, or conversely, those of you who've never had one in hand and wonder what all the commotion is about, the short answer is everything its fans already loved about it. From its mid-20th century rangefinder-inspired industrial design to hybrid viewfinder, film simulations, leaf shutter-enabling high-speed sync from its built-in flash and more, the X100V remains first and foremost an X100. The more interesting question to most of you is probably, what's different? The short answer to that is a whole bunch of new stuff and more than a couple of refinements. The X100V, fifth generation, but it's still pronounced V, sports a new lens, which promises superior performance while retaining the same focal length and maximum aperture of the one found on the F, which would be 23mm F2, the full-frame equivalent of a 35mm, call it if you don't mind, F2.8 for depth of field purposes and ease of comparison, a new EVF 3.7 million dot OLED up from 2.4 non-OLED, which is a big deal for me, a new OVF, nominally brighter, but I didn't have a problem with the one in the F. A new articulating rear panel, perhaps the biggest deal in my book, Hold That Thought. Even bigger than a new sensor and processor combination, at least for the X100 line anyway. It's actually the same combo found in the X Pro 3 and XT3. Together, these allow for autofocusing down to minus 5 EV, video up to 8-bit 420 4K internal, 10-bit 422 out via HDMI and up to full HD 120 frames per second, where the XF100 only did up to 
HD60. Burst rate, as I recall, up to 11 frames per second mechanical, to be determined up from the F8. New, for the first time, weather sealing, though one needs to attach the included adapter ring and protection filter for that purpose. And a new higher price, $1,400 versus the X100F's current $1,100. But, as I just mentioned, Fujifilm has done a good amount of tweaking on the X100 too, as in a refined body. Top and bottom plates are now made out of aluminum, the articulating rear panel making the entire package ever so slightly thicker, little taller, even though they've managed to make it flush with the rest of the rear fascia. A refined ISO dial making it much easier to change ISO old school. I like it. A refined control focus ring, hold that thought, and a refined internal ND, now four stops up from three. But, you may be wondering next, what's the difference in the real world? For me, the net of it is simple. The X100V is easier to compose with, adjust, and shoot than the X100F, which in turn gave me a higher hit rate of in-focus, properly exposed, compositionally interesting, emotionally satisfying shots. For me. As I said earlier, the EVF is a big improvement, especially in this regard. The rear tilty screen offers a critical compositional and framing advantage over all previous X100s. It allows me to shoot from the waist, shoot from an even lower angle without lying on the street, or shoot 90 degrees to my left or right without looking at the subject. When it comes to photography, that new 26.1 megapixel sensor and quad-core processor, as I said, first found in the X-T3, coupled to the new lens, beyond the video specs, result in noticeably improved autofocus, general snappiness, and burst rate. The redesigned ISO dial collar around the shutter speed dial is a day-in, day-out, real-world improvement I really appreciate, even if one can adjust the ISO by using the front control dial. The bottom line, well, if I were in the market for an X100, this is the one I would get, the extra $300 over the X100, absolutely worth it, Hold that thought, too, because I already have a lot of gear, I have very specific wants and desires, and I do have some nits. Of course, different strokes for different folks. There are a lot of competitors out there, beginning with every other Fujifilm camera with this sensor-processor combination, and a couple that don't have that. But let's get to that by first asking, for whom is the X100V designed? Instead of labels like street shooter, casual travel photographer, or someone just wanting to document life, all valid, let's set those aside long enough to start first with the intent of a likely buyer. Perhaps one, someone who wants the rangefinder form factor. We can talk about why that might be from its small size, simplicity, and lightweight, perhaps to being right eye dominant or being tired of autofocus points careening around the viewfinder in direct proportion to how often and where one's nose happens to hit a rear touch panel. We might be talking about someone who understands why showing a bit of one's face next to the camera rather than disappearing behind it, especially on the street, can engender a little less anxiety, a little more trust, a moment of deeper connection with the subject. Maybe we're talking about someone who just enjoys the design reference to the original Leicas and Contaxes of the last century. Two. Maybe someone who wants much of the mid-20th century rangefinder experience in a modern idiom. Small, light, simple, yes, but also fast, quiet, unobtrusive, with an actual optical viewfinder on the left. Though, like the X-Pro series, not a true rangefinder focusing mechanism. I'll put a link to my previous reviews of the X-Pro 3 and X-Pro 2 down below so that you can learn more about that, or up above if I remember, I never do. Yet also appreciates autofocus and EVF to dial in WYSIWYG exposure in real time. Recent gains in lens performance, dynamic range, noise performance from the sensor, and the convenience, power, and arguably lower environmental impact of digital workflow from edit to print and or social media. Three, someone who appreciates the creative value of limitations and enjoys the rigor of working with a single field of view. Four, ironically, maybe someone who also wants a piece of the mid-20th century twin lens reflex experience more precisely to my mind, the two primary TLR advantages, a waist-level perspective with the concomitant benefit of being even less obtrusive. Five, 
Someone who doesn't mind the absence of Ibis. While we're at it, someone who does not harbor ambitions for more than 24-ish megapixels worth of resolution. Six, someone who wants weather sealing. Seven, someone who appreciates high-quality imagery compared especially to smartphones on the one hand, yet also isn't looking for the finest details, dynamic range, or high ISO noise performance possible from the highest performance lens and sensors out there on the other. Eight, someone who appreciates Fujifilm's color science in film simulations like I do. Nine, perhaps someone who wants to enter the Fujifilm ecosystem relatively economically, at least if we're talking new, maybe wants to explore very high quality video too. 10. Conversely, maybe a long time like a M shooter who has pared down to a single Summicron or Summilux 35 and realized it's more weight and more manual focusing than he or she cares to do at this point. Finally, 11. And I think that's more than enough. Perhaps someone who has lost his or her way after many years of shooting. Maybe someone who already has more cameras and lenses than makes sense. Someone who wants to find the way back to the original joy of photography at a relatively affordable price. I think this is the way to contemplate the X100V's relevance to you and what you do and how it stacks up against the competition. That competition begins, really, with the X100V's own Fujifilm siblings. Of course, there are more nuances among the various cameras than I'll enumerate here, but it seems to me that the salient points are these. If you like the rangefinder style and want the latest sensor and processor, but also want interchangeable lenses and don't mind paying almost twice the price or more, the $1,800 X-Pro3 with $450 XF23 F2 or 900 XF23 1.4 is the way to go, although the 1.4 is not weather sealed. If you don't like the rangefinder style or are more heavily into video and can swing the price, the $1,500 body-only X-T3 is the way to go. If you do, on the other hand, like the rangefinder style body and are not into video, do like the flexibility of interchangeable lenses. In fact, do like the X-Pro3 but can't afford it and don't mind the absence of an articulating rear screen, nor are particularly bothered by using the company's last generation sensor and processor, you should think about the $1,300 X-Pro2. If you love the idea of the smaller X100V but can't swing the price, can live without 4K recording or a tilty screen, and as I just said more generally, the latest sensor, processor, autofocus, and or the much better EVF, the $1,100 X100F is the way to go if, again, you're thinking of buying new. If the absence of an articulating screen, relatively slow autofocus, and resolution as low as 12 megapixels don't bother you, heck, you can head over to eBay where you'll find X100Ts, S's, and the original 12 megapixel X100 for a lot less than that. Sniffing at 12 megapixels? Don't. Be clear about why you think you need more. My Leica M8 was only 10.2, my Canon EOS 1D only 4, and I got some great images from both of them. This basic point, buying used, is just as appropriate when discussing any of these options, by the way. Moving on still within the Fujifilm family. If the X-T3 is what appeals to you most thus far in the conversation, but you can't afford it, take a look at the $900 body-only X-T30, which, unlike the X-100F, does have the latest sensor and video capabilities. If the X-T30 is a bit too much and or you anticipate vlogging and have a need for a flippy screen, seems to me the $700 body-only X-T200 should be the first camera you look into within the Fujifilm lineup, though it does not have the latest X-Trans sensor of its bigger brothers. In either case, both are a little bit too small for my hands. If $700 feels like the right price, yet you still love the idea of owning a Fujifilm rangefinder-style camera, the X-E3 could be a compelling choice for you. But let's talk about other brands out there, because in doing so, it becomes even clearer why the X100V is likely to be very popular. The most competitive mainstream APS-C camera system out there, mirrorless system out there, which also happens to have a rangefinder-inspired form, is Sony's A6000 series. I'm talking most directly about the $600 body-only A6100, $900 body-only A6400, and $1200 body-only in-body image stabilized A6600. We own an A6400, we have a pile of glass for it, and it was the original A6000 that convinced me to exit full frame altogether after more than 40 years shooting Canon full frame cameras of every stripe. Its autofocus performance is among the best out there. But at this point, I'd have to say, as long as you are happy with APS-C sensors, Fujifilm should be your first port of call, 
because of its dedication to the format, as evidenced by a complete, highly performant, reasonably priced, dedicated APS-C lens line. The priority the company gives to the photographer's experience. And finally, both the latest autofocus and video capabilities in its most recent cameras, including the X100V, which have dramatically closed the gap between Fujifilm and both Sony and Canon. In fact, it well exceeds them on video. Now, credit where credit is due, Sony has set the pace for and been extraordinarily successful in the full-frame mirrorless market. Their skill, business acumen, and long list of product accomplishments in their full-frame lineup is Beyond dispute, the A7R4 is a technological tour de force unmatched in the category, or pretty much anywhere else. But that, in large measure, is the primary reason for the three major weaknesses of Sony's APS-C lineup. First, Sony offers a small number of top-quality APS-C coverage-only optics. Their new 16-55 to 2.8G Master notwithstanding, their business model seems predicated on the supposition that their more discerning APS-C customers will buy full-frame optics for their APS-C bodies and or switch to full-frame altogether. No need, then, or desire to focus on lower-margin, lower-priced glass. You know what? With lenses like their 50 1.8 and 85 1.8, I think it's smart and it's probably working for them. Second, Sony continues to deliver a user experience essentially unchanged from 2014, which is when I cut over to the A6000. It wasn't much of an issue for me back then, didn't bother me at all in point of fact, but as our expectations and ambitions have risen, that user experience has become maddening in comparison to what else is now available. From menu system to touch interface to physical controls, Fujifilm's APS-C cameras are streets ahead, pun intended. Third, Sony's hybrid line is no longer competitive, at least from a specs basis, with Fujifilm or the Micro Thirds space, especially as represented by Panasonic. While Fujifilm's emphasis has been on uncompromised APS-C and medium format hybrids, Sony's emphasis has been on full frame hybrids, as I just mentioned, and dedicated video cameras. The issue, I think, is very much like that faced by Canon with its EOS cinema line a concern with product cannibalization. Fujifilm simply does not have this conflict. Sure, if you want sensor-based image stabilization in an interchangeable lens APS-C mirrorless camera capable of 4K recording, yeah, the only game in town at the moment is the A6600. But the IBIS unit in that is similar, perhaps identical, to that in the HD-only A6500, and it's just not a compelling IBIS implementation. Next, Nikon. Nikon is now in the mirrorless APS-C game with their 860 buck non-IBIS-equipped Z50, and this is a much more interesting camera than generally recognized, I think. But it is a very different shooting experience from that of any Fuji camera. Their dedicated APS-C Z-line is in its infancy, and while I have one in-house at the moment, it's too early for me to say much more about it. Canon has had their APS-C mirrorless EOS M line in the market since 2012, but if the Nikon Z50 is a very different kind of shooting experience from Fuji, Canon's EOS M line is profoundly different in just about every way. There's really not much more for me to say here. Not that it isn't a great system for those among us who enjoy it. It's just that I can't imagine significant crossover between Canon EOS M and Fuji shooters, but I could be wrong. The last APS-C cameras I want to mention are Leica's TL2 and CL, and yeah, they are very expensive by comparison. They offer fewer bells and whistles, and their lens catalog is much smaller. But I will also tell you, from build quality to image quality of the lenses they do offer to user experience, especially for street work, the Leicas are unmatched. It's why we own a CL and a couple of their primes. With this said, if we hadn't gone Leica for our personal street work, we might well have gone with Fujifilm, either the X-T3 or X-Pro3, probably with the 1614, 5612, maybe the 3514. Or 
we might have waited to see what happens with an XP4. <laughs> Who am I kidding? I'm waiting right now. <sighs> what else? While we're talking about expensive, I can also say that it is a testament to the X100V that one can contemplate within the same decision-making process. Sony's Rangefinder Style $3,300 autofocusing 35mm f2 fixed lens full frame 42 megapixel RX1 R2. Like his exceptional Rangefinder Style 5 grand autofocusing with the best manual focus as well 28mm 1.7 fixed lens also full frame 47 megapixel Q2. And now, with their new 45.4p Hasselblad's almost kind of rangefinder style, call it seven grand autofocusing interchangeable lens medium format 50 megapixel X1D2. Or, to bring it a little closer to earth anyway, a very used manual only focusing digital or film Leica M. Very down to earth, perhaps the latest $900 Ricoh GR3, though I've never had one in hand and it has no viewfinder. I've already gone on much longer than I'd intended, so I'm not going to get into it here other than to say this. To be fair, each is compelling in its own way to its own community fans, each embodying many of the same attributes that make the X100V so attractive price aside. In fact, among all of these competitors outside of Fujifilm itself, the one camera I think closest to the X100V in spirit and function, the one irrespective of budget that would be at the top of my list, is the more than three times the price like a Q2. Number two on my personal list, I am shocked to tell you that it would now be the X1D2 with the 45 F4, which is, by the way, the field of view and depth of field equivalent, really identical to the XV's 23.2, set to manual focus with manual exposure, if in either case money were no object. But that's another video or two for another time. For now, I'll say simply about these. One, these vastly more expensive options do offer in my hands and to my eye at the sizes we print, view, and crop the crap out of images. Immediately apparent, superior image quality, build quality, industrial design, user interface, and ergonomics. These things matter to me greatly. It's why we also have an SL2. Two, as well they should for the price. And three, with all of this said, for 99% of us, 99% of the time, for me, a good chunk of the time, the X100V would be a better choice. Which makes this a reasonable time, I think, to now articulate the things I don't love about the X100V and bring this video to a close. Because there are things about the X100 series, even with the V, just as with every camera ever made, that I prefer were different. Though, I'd have to say, really, these are just nits. First up. Secondary and primary, now that I think about it, controls, as I alluded to earlier. I found the aperture ring too close to the camera body to comfortably move. Similarly, while the control ring feels better than the one on the X100F, it's still not comfortable for me. It's, it's too tight. Your mileage may vary in either case, and that's fine. I wish there were a depth of field scale on the lens or electronically displayed in the viewfinder so that zone focus was easier. Yes, the autofocus is definitely snappier, better than the X100F, but that didn't stop me from the occasional out-of-focus shot that would have been no problem with zone focus. Again, true of even the best autofocus in cameras. I found myself inadvertently pressing the control dials, resulting at one point in front and rear dials simultaneously controlling shutter speed, though I'm sure I'd work that out quickly with just a little more use. I found the diopter would often come out of my pocket, dialed in differently than how it went in. I think this is not so easy to manage given the current design. That's just the way it is. So I'd suggest modifying it to, for example, a pop-up button for setting it and then pushing it in until it clicks and locks, like on my Leica CL. Claudia CL. As has been the case on most Fujifilm cameras, the joystick does not fall quite under my thumb naturally. It's a little bit small, requiring me to change my grip. Though I imagine I'd also quickly adjust to that. I don't like micro HDMI ports, but insofar as I wouldn't use the X100V for video, it's no big deal. I'm glad it's there, though, rather than being absent. Next up, the EVF. As I've mentioned a couple of times, the EVF is a market improvement over the X100F. 
I like it much better, but I wish it were even higher magnification and with longer eye relief. I was still able to see the center of the frame clearly, not a big deal, but between my glasses and my eyesight, progressive lenses, bigger and longer is where it's at. And why I love, for example, the variable 0.83x magnification of the 3.7 million dot EVF of the Panasonic Lumix G9, never mind the 5.7 million dot UXGA EVF of my Leica SL2. I don't love the optional EVF patch in the lower right corner of the optical finder. I'd much prefer to see, though I have no idea if this is physically possible or economically feasible, a simulated central microprism or split image rangefinder patch like those used in the ground glass of film SLRs of old or found in the X-T3 today. Very cool. What are we up to? Third? Fourth? Third. The rear panel. Don't misunderstand. As I've said about this already too, I think this is a significant improvement over the F, possibly the biggest thing about it, and I had no trouble using it on a very gray but bright day. I love that unlike so many other cameras, though like the X-Pro3, when tilted 90 degrees for waist level viewing, it is not blocked by the viewfinder. It also feels very solid, even though I think it may be the thinnest articulating screen I've ever seen. A good thing to be confirmed. My only gripe with it is that it wasn't easy to pull out with gloves, even glove liners. Doable a bit more fiddly than I'd like. Then again, there are very few current generation cameras that can be used without taking off one's gloves either. I think too many of us have become house cats. Last, while some of you may complain about the grip, the camera is so light and such an homage to mid-20th century rangefinders that I don't mind it one bit. Yeah. I didn't have time to test the remote app. I wasn't inclined to do clinical tests of resistance to flare or chromatic aberration in the few hours I had it in hand, nor did I do detailed side-by-side -side image quality comparisons. Those kinds of things will have to wait for another time. For now, and to close, all I really want to say is, guys, Fujifilm, thank you. Thank you for continuing to give us and continually improving upon a wonderfully wide range of photographer-centric cameras and purpose-built lenses with personality and performance at prices, sizes, and weights more accessible to more of us. That's it.